Welcome to the madhouse. <laughs> What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the Mindless Horror Podcast, the podcast we talk about everything and anything horror. I'm your host, Anthony. It's your boy, Sam. We're back at it with an interview. Another another great, fantastic interview, one I'm looking forward to. One, Definitely. We, uh, we watched uh, this man's movie last night as of this recording, and we we really enjoyed it. We had fun with it. We cooked some dinner, and we just kind of chilled and kicked back. And it, it was a fun movie to watch. Definitely was fun. Good horror movie. And um, well, why don't you just introduce yourself, my uh, guest? Yeah, uh, my name is Dakota Esquivel. I'm the uh, writer and director of Deadly Crush. I think he wanted me to introduce myself because he was he was very intimidated by my last name. I very much was. <laughs> I didn't want to butcher it again, and yeah. um, I, I I just no worries, I I man. feel bad when I butcher getting that name, and it just it just you know. But, no, uh, I, mean, I mean, I really appreciate you checking your white privilege at the door. I mean, everybody is all, you know, kosher now. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dakota has, uh, so you, what is it? You wrote, produced, and you actually starred in the movie as well, right? I mean, I didn't star, uh, I mean, uh, look, I mean, the, uh, the role that I did uh, involved a lot of stunts. And because, you know, it's a cheap-ass production. Uh, I couldn't ask anybody to do any of the stunts, so they, I, they, I pretty much put a wig on and and you know, yell to action. Nice. No, that's knock me around a bit. That's uh, but that that's that's the risk you take when you when you want to do a movie and and you don't you know it's yeah I get what you're saying, yeah. man. And uh, no insurance. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this movie Deadly Crush it came out in 2018, um, so it's it's pretty it's pretty new. Definitely pretty new. Yeah, and uh, we we watched. Months. It's about three months. Three months. Yeah. Wow, so, that's that's really yeah. new. it's really new. Yeah. So uh, we we. Yeah. We uh we watched the the movie last night. It was it was a fun film. I had fun watching it. I, I liked the story, the cool. concept. You don't see a lot of what you created uh, in modern cinema these days. You know, like I, I really liked the the concept of this horror movie. Um, yeah, I definitely I, I really enjoyed the like uh, Native American influences that are obviously there present. Um, you know, obviously a lot of horror movies that are coming out are very white influence, so it was nice to get a different perspective in the horror industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Dakota, you want to talk a little bit about uh, sure. what uh, what was your main influence for this film? So, I did a... Uh, so, my first film I did, that, the Cannes Film Festival, uh, and it was this, you know, this con artist kind of film. So, we went over to Cannes, uh, we went to the Cannes Film Market, and I was like, you know, schlepping my film around, trying to sell it. And uh, just trying to sell it to, like, France and Italy and Germany. I mean, you get a real quick idea of what they're looking for. Uh, you know, they don't want anything cerebral. They don't want. I mean, they want something with as little subtitles as possible. So I, uh, after that trip, because I didn't sell my film. I mean, I, I got to the seller. So I went. You know, when I came back, I'm like, you know what they're looking for? They're looking for something like I could pitch in one sentence. And basically, I came up with Ghostfucker. <laughs> and. And from the very beginning, it was like fade in. All right, what you know? What sentence is going to enforce the ghost fucker, uh, you know, theme plot? And the and and I tried every every page to go. All right, ghost fucker. What's a ghost fucker going to do? <laughs> you know, that's what. And and that's basically what it was. And in fact, that's what it was called. It was called Ghost Fucker uh, while we were shooting. Oh, that's, so that was like the working title then. That was. I mean, like I think there was an asterisk. With the U and the C, you know, I got a little bit of class. But yeah. Other than that, you know, yeah, it was pretty much ghost fucker until the until like it, it got picked up by a sales agent, and we're like, well, all right, uh, you know, uh, there's some Catholics out there, so let's take out the fucker. I'm like, all right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah I mean, I, so yeah, this movie is very interesting, um, and I, I really like the uh, the whole the backstory about leading up to you know the the final. 
up to the very final scene of the movie and stuff like that. Um, the whole backstory of the the couple and and you know they're all they're they are robbing like you know liquor stores, different uh, stuff like that. And I and I really like the whole kind of rebel aspect of that, you know. And then like they're just a bunch of rebels cool. doing what they can and stuff to to make a living and stuff. And I I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Uh, but going into the film, uh, seeing all the stuff kind of go down in the first like half of the movie it automatically caught my interest you're like qu kind of wondering okay well what just happened because you know you see this you see this scene and something goes down and then it just cuts to like the next thing so they keeps it keeps the question going like what what happened and as the movie progresses you start seeing that backstory which i really enjoyed um i love when films do that when they eventually uh, explain it because it keeps you wondering and it keeps you wanting to watch as to what what happened yeah definitely i agree that it was good in that aspect of like it kept you wanting more uh, i really enjoyed the relationship aspect of it obviously you have the three characters in the beginning of the film and how their relationships entangled um, and then it's kind of like you're going all the way down to the end of like what really happened and like what really caused, you know, the incident. Right, right. Without giving too much it, away. It, I mean, it's it's pretty crazy to hear you know um, people's reaction to it because it has, you know, like a an overtly sexual theme to it. You would have believed just across the board the different polarities that that people have come away with. I've had reviews that said like this is just it's it's porn. It's I mean it's just way too much sex. There's sex everywhere. This goes to just ramming this girl every five minutes, and I'm like, really? I didn't. I had no. And and at first, we had to market it as an erotic supernatural thriller because all the early reviews were like, this 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 movie has way too much sex in it. Uh, and then like my dad, who's a Eucharistic minister, he saw it and he's like, there's it's the same amount of sex that you'd see anywhere. Yeah. Uh, I, so it's so I think in uh, I don't know maybe it's um, like domestic. You know, when it comes to sex, it's just it, I, some people just don't know how to handle themselves. You can blow someone's head off, right? You can torture them and all of that stuff. But when it comes to like a suggestion of insertion, people sometimes lose their shit. Yeah, I've I've noticed that over the years for for movies, like people will go off on like stuff that like they didn't think was right for the film or they had right. issues with, and right. I, the way I, I I go into every situation and. It kind of it kind of brings me to the point where it's just like, well, you know, and you can't please everyone in the world. You know, there's always going to be yeah. someone that critiques and critics everything. Um, sure. But as far as us, I mean, we enjoyed it. I mean, it, it, like like oh, Sam said, it had the it had the right amount of storytelling mixed with the right amount of the chemistry between all the characters. Um, cool. So, I mean, it, it definitely, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of the stuff that was in the movie was actually necessary because it, it helps explain the plot more. He's not just having sex with this girl just to have sex with her. He, this girl reminds her um, of his girl. Yeah. Therefore, it actually, it actually has a purpose for it. And that's crazy because, because a lot of people just miss that. They're like, why is this ghost, he's just a horn dog. Like, all he wants to do is bone, bone, bone. I'm like, Really? Should I have spent like an hour in the beginning of him just like you know, just you know looking for a surrogate? No, and then and that's uh, so. Uh, I should probably say this before we go any further. There's gonna be a little bit of spoilers uh, in this podcast, only because like I can't talk about one thing without talking about another thing. Oh, for sure. So, yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. So yeah, definitely, no, for sure though, check out um, Deadly Crush. Uh, it's on Amazon and other uh, places. I think you can rent movies. I, I, for sure, I know it's yeah. on Amazon. I know that for much, but, um, yeah, 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 yeah. so my, my whole thing was like, you know, in the end of the movie, uh, he, you know, he's already put, he's put like, um, kind of took over the, the body of, of the, what was his name? Liam, lead. right? Lead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bryn. Bryn. Oh uh, yeah. Um, and you know, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're going away. They're, they're, you know, they're in love and stuff like that, but you actually see one point where he misleads and calls, you know, his ex-girlfriend's name. Um, uh, and that right there was when I realized, I was like, oh, okay, so he thinks, you know, she reminds him so much of his ex-girlfriend that, you know, he, she can't really let him go, or, you know, he can't let her go and stuff like that, so it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it, it, it's all gonna come full circle, everything makes sense, you, and, and as the movie goes on, they put hints as to, yeah, he thinks this is he. This is he's kind of trying to relive his past again, and, and that's at least what I took from it. 
I mean, you're 100% correct. Um, so the thing about ghosts, and, and, and I did some, so uh, the, the reason why ghosts walk through walls is because at the time of their death, there was a different floor plan to when they were living. That's, so when they were walking, that wall wasn't there before. That, and, and that's why ghosts sort of, you know, you know walk through walls. Um, and but what ghosts usually are, they're just fugue states. They're this mental energy, I guess, that like is locked into a loop. They don't have any growth. They don't know how to adapt. They don't know how to change. They're just set on repeat the entire time. Right. Um, and, 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 and so when this ghost, uh, you know, a, a, another spoiler, when this ghost enters the woman's mind for the first time, she's actually having a wet dream. She's having a sexual dream. Right. And that was his and that's his only contact with her. And that's why throughout the entire film, all he knows how to connect with her is sexually. Right. So the entire time it was just I mean, that's why like look, if, if she was reading a book on Shakespeare and he invaded her mind then, then all he would do is talk about Shakespeare. But because like, you know, all he knows about her is this, you know, sexual aspect of her. That's why you see him just always trying to seduce her because that's the only thing he knows how to do. Right, and 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 you do bring up that point too because you do in the script or not in the script, but in the movie she does talk about how she hasn't had any like sexual relations in like a year or something right. like that, and and that furthers the plot more. Like, okay, that's why the ghost is doing what she did because she had that wet dream, and right. the you know she she does mention that she she had she hadn't had any sexual relations with uh, right. anyone in like a year and stuff like that. So that furthers the plot as to what, um, you know, her intentions were and what, why the ghost is doing what the ghost is doing. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why like, like I, like I, I immediately kind of got it. Like I was like, okay, I, I could see where this is going and right. I could see the, the whole, so like any, everything in the movie like really didn't bother me. It was more, it was just like, I was trying to just kind of, as the movie was going on, I was trying to just piece together like a detective. Right. Right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. You know, you know, an, an interesting backstory. So, like, I was um, doing research on ghost sex because, you know, I mean, there's just all throughout history. Yeah. There's even in the Bible, like, uh, um, ghost sex. And there was this entire, I think it was Russia or some kind of, you know, somewhere in East, where entire town, all of these women uh, were, you know, swore that they were being, you know, molested and, 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 and you know, sexually uh, accosted right. in the night. And, and all of them swore by it. And I believe what happened was um, there's a local dentist who taught these <laughs> these young thugs how to how to uh, how to uh, control like gas, like uh, uh, you know like uh, what do you call that gas that they use when when they give a root canal? Oh, uh, you're that, talking about the the laughing gas. Yeah, I know which one. Yeah, the laughing gas. Yeah. And what these guys were doing. Um, was that uh, they would go to a house, they would pump laughing gas into the house while everyone's asleep. And then, uh, you know, once they believe that, you know, that she's out, they would go in the house and they would rape her. And some of the uh, circumstances where they would rape this woman while the husband was knocked unconscious in the same bed. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that goes pretty, pretty dark right there, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm like... Yeah, that's a storyline I'm probably not going to sell to uh, to uh, China. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that, but that's a real thing. What what I also thought was interesting too is you have the <laughs> dynamic of the person that she's painting. I I forget his name off the top of my head right now. Um, yeah, Kit. Kit. Yeah. What is Kit the guy that she's painting? Uh. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she's painting him, and then like their relationship is weird too. Like. I, I, I really found it, like, difficult, like, interesting, her, like, relationship with him, and then, like, when, obviously, his body's taken over, like, she still, like, can, like, like, have relations with him, because it's, like, obviously, he's tried to rape her, like, twice now. Oh, yeah, for sure, yeah. And I thought that was really interesting, like, how desperate she kind of was for connection with someone, and that's kind of, that's how I, like, took that, I perceived that. You know, you're, the you're, character. you're absolutely right. When the actress was workshopping it, because she was workshopping it for a month before we can, uh, you know, you know, before we shot, and basically her view was that all through high school, when when you see, when you hear about like uh, a woman or you know an, an underage girl, when they lose their virginity for the first time, um, they have this unreasonable connection with this guy, and this, and they will let this guy go through. I mean. Uh, he, will put her through so much shit 
But because she lost her virginity to him, she, like, she's completely unreasonable in her expectations. And that's how the actress approached that. She was like, look, look I mean, like, uh, like, you know, like Madonna's song, like, uh, what's that song? Uh, uh, like a virgin? Yeah, like, like a virgin or uh, you know, feels like the first time by a foreigner. That was her approach. Like, it, it, she's all of a sudden unreasonable in regards to sex with this entity. Yeah, uh, yeah, because I, I I remember that too, and I was like, okay, that. Uh, but then that's that's funny that you bring that up too, because it was uh, it was just that she was just so she just wanted to be with someone, and yeah. and and that the ghost made her just feel kind of like herself again, um, right. which I and I really like the relationship as it goes on, like when from when we first see the interaction with the ghost and her to the very end of the movie, you know, when they're in a relationship, they're on the road together, and then eventually when he becomes decayed and right. she has to stop him which i have to i have to say that decaying scene was like really good like that cool. thank you the way that makeup came out was just phenomenal that was awesome yeah. um yeah. <laughs> and i really that was like when i saw that i was like wow that's some like walking dead kind of stuff right there man that looks dope yeah <laughs> yeah, um, yeah um funnily enough our uh, makeup artist is the uh, ex-wife of uh, twiggy um, a Marilyn Manson's guitarist, uh, uh, Marilyn, yeah, Marilyn Manson's lead guitarist. Nice, yeah, she uh, she did an amazing job of uh, of uh, putting that together, and I liked a lot of that. Uh, a lot of the makeup actually in this movie was really good. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, so Ooh, thank you. We go back to so you what what so you directed? Did you you produced the movie as well, right? And wrote it? Uh, uh, so for sure, I wrote it. And I directed it. We do have a producer. I executive produced it. Okay. Uh, meaning, meaning, I found uh, you know most of the funds to finance it, but our producer is the one. <laughs> so her pitch was that we're going to shoot in Yosemite, uh, and and for the you know for the listeners out there, Yosemite is about maybe seven hours away from L.A. Right. Uh, and it's a and it's a monstrous it's a monstrous drive, uh, uh, but her pitch was you know to her friend to her crew, look if you're not doing anything for the next two weeks because we have fifteen days to shoot. If you're not doing anything for the next two weeks, uh, you know, why don't you, we, we can't pay you too much, but we, what we can promise you is that we can buy you all the alcohol that you'll ever need for for 15 days. <laughs> and that's and that's basically what it was. We had 10 hour shoots uh, at the most, and I, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, maybe they had 12 hours of party every night. Nice. It was. It, I I couldn't believe the stamina. Wow. Yeah. So you said you shot this movie in fifteen days. Fifteen days. Yeah. I think you just beat Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Halloween. Yeah, I think yeah, was shot like a was, month. Yeah. Fifty. I mean, we did have uh, uh, two pickups, meaning like uh, after after we edited it, uh, we needed maybe uh, two two day shoots, which we went to Big Bear for. Uh, but yeah, it was fifteen days, maybe ninety five percent of the uh, of the film. So, uh, in total, though, how long have you been doing all of this? Like, have you been doing it for a while now? I've been doing screenwriting for a while. So, uh, so I started out uh, uh, with so my first gig was with Stan Lee. Uh, you know, R.I.P. Uh, Late great Stan Lee. Yeah, direct- the great Stan Lee. Yeah, uh, I was his director of development for one of his production companies. I started off with him, uh, and, and I was and I went to uh, I graduated from UCLA uh, masters in screenwriting. Um, and then I just did a lot of internships reading scripts, which is the best way you could learn to write. And uh, I directed my first film, I think, in 2012. This is my second one. But this, is, this is the first one that was released. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, you talked a little bit about that before. I remember we uh, before we started, you talked about uh, working with Stan Lee. And uh, yeah. you, 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 you've, you've actually, uh, you've so you've been around the block a couple of times to kind of get an idea of what, what goes around in the, in the, in the behind the scenes and stuff, which is and always a good, uh, a good thing before you actually launch your own movies to get an idea of how things run um, and stuff like that. And that's why I love watching behind the scenes stuff and everything all the time because I always get to get an that's idea. That's crazy. Yeah, I get the idea how how yeah. I I think I've been on a I've been on one uh, indie movie set. I helped my my cousin's in the business. He uh, he's a sound guy for the show um, Blackish right now. Oh right um, on. Okay. Yeah, and right prior on. to that he did Bones, and then prior to that was uh, oh, Bones. Okay. Reno Nine One One. Oh um, Reno, I love that. I, I love Reno Nine One One. Yeah, and he uh, he was telling me so much stuff about the business. Um, 
but I actually went on set with him to, for two weekends one time and kind of got an idea of what stuff is like, um, how a production moves and stuff like that. Um, what did you think about it? I, 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 I really enjoyed it. Um, so, you know, there's a call time for everybody, obviously. Um, yeah. We were always, I think, 6 a.m. every day because we had to set up our sound equipment and stuff like that. But everybody, the, the production actually didn't get started till about 10 o'clock. Because you have that four hours of everybody getting up, showing up, getting costume, makeup, everything, oh, lighting, okay. sounding, you know, all that stuff, getting ready. Uh, and then usually, uh, or at least with this production, it was the same scene a couple times, just in different angles, because they only had okay. one camera to work with. Um, but I thought it was just an interesting process of how everything goes down. I mean, you know, this was like a low-budget indie film. It's It's a movie coming out pretty soon it's it's a like a detective kind of mobster movie called uh burn and um burn yeah burn it's okay. it's coming out i don't know i don't they they haven't really i don't think they gave a release date yet i think they're still editing it but uh this was about over a year ago when i went over and um yeah i i just thought it was an interesting thing though i mean everyone is cool there though everybody on set was really cool um you had people who were you know, I would bust out movie references and people would just go ape shit about them and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Just talking to people. Like, I would, I, was, I would always show up on set with my... I have, a, I have a, a vest of just patches of bands and stuff like that. So people would always come up to me and talk to me about it. Um, what bands? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm into, like, heavy metal. So, like, Iron Maiden, Metallica, Megadeth. I got a oh, couple... Those are all those standards. Yeah, a couple punk bands like Operation Ivy, Black Flag, you yeah, know. Sure, sure. All, the, all the good stuff, you know. All the music that you hear on on the film, or, or you know, or at least the the uh, rock music, that that's me in my studio. I I saw that in the credits. I saw that you had wrote yeah, all yeah. those songs, and I was very impressed with that, very much. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty um, fun. Uh, with that being said, do you have a band? I did have a band. Like I, I was actually a rock band for like five years. Uh, like our our claim to fame was we opened for Kelly Clarkson on on one of our tours. Nice, uh, that's sick. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I mean it's. A, you know, now that everything is all, you know, home-based, uh, I'm always experimenting with, like, sounds and stuff. Not so much now that I'm directing, but, but that's where I got my start. Uh, do you do you play? Uh, I'm learning bass right now. So, I mean, a couple – what I've learned so far was, like, Highway to Hell and a couple Misfits songs. Right. right. And look, I got a three-year-old kid, and, that, and you mentioned three of the bands that he loves. Nice. There you go. I mean, I, you're – I as, as a fan of rock and roll – I, I want to thank you for getting your kids started early, you know? <laughs> Got it. I mean, I, I kind of opened the uh, gates for him. I was like, uh, you know, I want this kid to have some class. I'm going to play some classical. I'm going to play some blues and stuff. And the kid just loves heavy metal uh, and heavy metal. I mean, that's just all he wants. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I don't blame him. But that's, heavy metal is amazing. Um, yeah. So, I mean... Well, uh, Metallica and ACDC. I mean, you can't go wrong with that. Oh yeah, you can't. You can't. You can't at all. Um, I'm I'm curious to see. I, I, a lot of the locations I saw in the movie looked uh, very much like uh, kind of like a cabin in the woods kind of vibe to it. So where where was a lot of the locations shot for this film? Um, so so there was a so there was a cabin that we rented. There was a huge cabin. We tried to make it as small as possible, or small looking as possible. It's a huge cabin where we all, I think, twenty of us, twenty five of us, we all slept. I mean, I mean, they had their own rooms. I had to sleep on the floor and stuff like that. But, but, you know, our our uh, our set was our our base camp. That's where we ate. That's where we slept. That's that, that was everything. There's a there's a litmus test, um, you know, that I do, like to see if if someone is if, is truly ready for like filmmaking. Because you did mention earlier on, hey man, this is something that that I might want to do. So, uh, so in every set, there's always these stories. Like, uh, um, like on our set, on um, one of the Saturdays, that was the only day that we would, uh, you know, have the crew off uh, uh, just to wander Yosemite for half the day. So at 8 a.m., everybody took a break, and, and the entire, you know, cast and crew left just to tour Yosemite. And it was just my producer and I. And we're sitting there, and it's, and it's 8.01. As soon as the door slams, boom, all the power goes off in the cabin. Wow. It's Saturday. It's 8.01. I'm like, what the fuck? So, uh, and it, so long story short, we found out that the person who rented us this location didn't pay the electricity bill for six months. Nice. So I wow. had, and, and, it's, and, they, and they close at 12, right? It's a Saturday. So I had like maybe a, a, you know, a couple hours to find out where the fuck this DWP was 
in Yosemite, which is probably like, you know, now Pollo Loco or something like that. I had to drive over there. I had to beg them, beg back the electricity and say, look, I'm not the, the guy that you want to lean on. You know, please, can you just turn on the electricity for the next 14 days? I think it was our, our, our third day shoot. I had to beg them back. And when I tell that story, uh, you know, my you know my question is like, okay, so how do you feel about that story? And usually people go, that's that's a shit show. That's crazy. I would not stand for that. Um, if if that story gets your blood boiling like you're on heroin, then filmmaking is for you. Because no, it does. Oh yeah, it yeah, does. Because filmmaking every day, it's putting out fires. It's it's finding out solutions. It's solving problems every minute of every day. And, if, and, and that kind of story, like, when, oh, oh shit, the, the shit has just hit the fan. And we are in the 11th hour. This is, this is the third act. What are you going to do? You just make it happen. You, and, and that's all filmmaking is. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I think the biggest issue we had on the set of, of Burn was uh, my, my, uh, my cousin's sound equipment. Uh, we were filming in, in a hotel in this bar. Uh, we were filming a bar scene, and on top of the bar scene, we were filming. Uh, we filmed some stuff outside. The biggest and most annoyingest thing you had to worry about with filming on location in like a bar type, especially like a bar, because a bar has a bunch of refrigerators and stuff like oh, that yeah. that are constantly on, and they're loud. You definitely are. You can't turn them off because if you turn them off, all the things gonna go spoiled in there, whatever's in okay. there. So our biggest problem was that we couldn't really use a boom mic too much because oh, if we used okay. the if we used the boom mic it would have picked up that audio and it would have sounded horrible um have you have you seen the final film uh, i have not yet and i have been constantly texting my cousin i have the <laughs> the filmmaker on social media but uh uh i think because this is like one of their passion projects that they actually are really taking the time to like edit it the way they want to and uh, right. I know they I know they finished principal photography of it, so right. now it's just a matter of editing it and making sure it's what they want. But uh, I'm constantly seeing he's all he's also doing a lot of other projects too that I really want to check out. He's always going into film festivals and stuff like that. So, where, where, do you know if he solved the problem with the fridge? Because that's that's that sounds crazy. The no, we never did um, because the guy actually it's funny the director who owned uh, the director who directed the movie was actually the. Uh, his like side gig was he was the I think he was the owner or the manager of the bar that we filmed at. Therefore, um, okay. he told us if we were to turn off the fridge that a lot of the stuff in there would go spoiled, so we couldn't turn it off. Um, so that was a pain, and then we filmed it. We filmed an outside scene, so we're in the middle of Los Angeles outside. Uh, mind you, it was the same weekend as the Grammys, so uh, Grammys are going on down the street. Um, we had fire trucks and police officer sirens constantly going off every time we would try to shoot. Um, yeah, sure. Did, did you get permits? Uh, I think they got permits to film at the hotel. Okay. Um, I don't know too much about what the production was because we came in pretty late on into the production. Um, right. They just kind of hired uh, as they went on to get different kinds of people. Um, cool. So they hired my cousin, and my cousin threw me the opportunity, so I just wanted to check it out. Uh, and he did it because one of his buddies was like, um, you know, can you come do this? We, we, we're like on the final two weekends and stuff, and we just need help to finish this last stuff up. And my buddy was like, or my cousin right, was like, right. yeah, for sure. So we finished that, and we went down to do it. Um, so we weren't in the production at, like, you know, not too long. We were mostly there, like, we were there, like, two weekends. Right, right. What kind of camera? Uh, what kind of camera? It, phew, I couldn't tell you honestly because like I was so focused and hell bent on to how the sound was going that I really wasn't paying attention to anything yeah, else. Sure. But, yeah, because I was just so boiled as much as he was on how the sound sounded and stuff like that. Because um, prior to the doing sound in film, I had done sound in high school uh, in in my theater department. I was the head of sound, so like. I can. I was seeing a lot of similarities too, as to what I did in theater and what I did for a movie, which is like there's, sure. when I look at it, there's also there's a lot. I mean, it's just basically bringing the stage to life on camera, and you got to hide more stuff so the camera doesn't see it. You know the dirty little secret, and, and only filmmakers know this. No, nobody else knows. The most important thing about a film is sound. Yeah, you can you you can uh, you can throw up a, uh, a you can use a shitty camera. You can even be unfocused. 
you could have all these like visually you you can look like you can make it look like crap but if the sound is pristine the audience is going to go ah oh, that's that's their aesthetic choice yeah. If the sound is crap, you're dead. You're dead. That's exactly what my cousin told me. That's funny that you bring yeah. that up because my cousin told me the thing. He goes, the, the movie can look the shittiest way as possible, but For if sure. the sound's not good, I guarantee no, you perfect. the movie's perfect. not good. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, I, mean I, would, I would put money on maybe 50% of the sound in that bar they're going to have to uh, um, you know, redo it in the studio. Yeah, we had to do a lot of uh, uh, wild sounds. We had to pull all the actors aside after yeah. each take and and just do wild yeah, sounds. Wild yeah, yeah. Well, the sound is most important. Don't I mean you gotta you gotta pay for that. That's what that's what that's what you always pay for. It's sound and, and and maybe if you're doing supernatural, then you do special effects. Oh yeah. But those those are the two sacred you know things that you never fuck with. Easily, yeah. Definitely. Um, you had mentioned previously because we were speaking that. You know, in this movie, you both directed and you wrote it. Um, what do you What do you find uh, you're more passionate about, directing or writing scripts? Writing is cool because uh, um, so there's this uh, theory that in order for you to be expert in something, you got to put in ten thousand hours, uh, no matter what it is. You know, so for writing, uh, I mean, I, I've easily done over ten thousand. I mean, twenty thousand, thirty thousand hours of just writing. So that's you know pretty. Uh, uh, that just comes out to me. Uh, you know the way a duck, uh, you know, floats on water. Directing is cool because um, because now you're responsible for how the the film looks. There is no misinterpretations. There is no oh, I thought it meant this or you know, n- nothing goes over your head. Me personally, um, it's hard to go back uh, uh, from directing back to writing. That's hard because I, because I know exactly how it should look and I, and I also know how to market the film as well. So it's kind of like it's a it's a door that once you open, uh, you you just can't close it. It's like some kind of porn, <laughs> like like porn is like that way. It's like if you open this door, man, uh, you know you know be warned that some doors you cannot close it anymore. And directing is one of them. Yeah, I I agree. So with that being said, what what really who or who actually uh, inspired you to really want to start filming? Like, was there a director or like was there a movie you watched where you're like. Man, I want to. I want to do that. Like that. This looks like a lot of fun. I want to give it a shot. See what I can do. Um. So, I mean, like, I grew up in comic books. So I thought Frank Miller, especially his black and white, like Sin City, um, comics were like, oh man. I mean, I think that's awesome. Uh, but I mean, uh, you know, Carnahan, he did Smoke and Aces. I thought he was awesome. Tarantino, I thought, you know, those guys are awesome. I mean, any, anything that that pushes the envelope. Uh, uh Tony Scott. Uh, um, and he committed suicide, but he's like my favorite director. That guy was just balls to the wall, and, and it was just—it's just awesome. Oh yeah, uh, uh, Frank Miller, one of my favorites. Um, that guy can write. That guy is like no, he's dumb. He's that dumb. guy's got like some. And one of my favorite, of course, comic books by him is uh, Sin City. Um, yeah. And what he did with that on film is is truly amazing. I, I love. I actually like both of those movies. Both of those movies are amazing um i was reading the graphic novels too i have like the first three um right. yeah sin city 300 it's just beautiful yeah 300 yeah. is also an amazing, fantastic and, that, and that's the thing like you 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 watch that and it's just beautiful I yeah mean, just beautiful to watch and i get it the dialogue is stylized and stuff like that but we need more of that because it's beautiful yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Um, yeah, I think a lot of yeah a, a lot of directors. I mean, there's like I have a lot of favorite directors, hands down. Like Quentin Tarantino, I love the way that guy shoots movies. Uh, yeah. One of my uh, favorite visually stunning uh, director is uh, visually uh, when he brings on to a movie is Zack Snyder. I love the way he he does when he oh, yeah, when, sure. when he um, when he directs movies and stuff like. Uh, sure. the way he shoots and stuff and like his, his vision as to when he brings it on screen is just phenomenal. What he did with Watchmen and a lot of the DC movies I, I, I've just enjoyed. And that's the thing, like, uh, you know, he, he catches a lot of shit for all the DC stuff, but if you, if you've actually read Watchmen, that's the best you can do. Yeah. What he did in Watchmen as a film, I mean, that's the best you can do for, for a crazy comic like that. Yeah, I, I agree because, um. And he even saved that movie because uh, at the end, if, if anyone's read the graphic novel, at the end they fight like a giant squid. And yeah. uh, <laughs> instead of the yeah. giant squid destroying the, the city, it was a bomb. And to Easter egg the squid, he named the bomb after the squid. So um, yeah, yeah. 
he kind of paid homages to it, but then he also saved the movie to make it a more realistic point of view, which I I really sure, thought sure. it was it was it was awesome. Three hundred. Uh, I mean, that's that, that's also just. I mean, we just need more more movies like that. Yeah, three hundred was visually stunning as well. Yeah. Um. I mean. I mean, try and pick a. I mean, like, but but the, even the two films that we that we just discussed, Sin City and Three Hundred, pick a more beautiful film than those two. Yeah, they're they're amazing. I love the way like Sin City really brought the comic book life. Uh, you know, yeah. it, we really brought it to life with you know Robert Rodriguez directing it, and of yeah. course Frank Miller. Uh, he's he was helping out. You had, uh, yeah. I believe you had Quentin Tarantino made a guest appearance to direct the first one as well. He did some oh, scenes, yeah, okay. and. Um, yeah, just the fact that uh, the way he brought those pages to life was just amazing, and it looked like just like the comic book, black and white, had that yeah, noir film. No grays, no grays, just two colors. Yeah, it, it had that noir, and a little bit of red every now and then uh, for yeah, blood, yeah. but it was necessary and it was awesome. Red and yellow, right, for the second one. Yeah, the yellow because of the uh, the deformed uh, sun. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. Um, so there's something that I wanted to talk about with you uh, specifically because I want to get your take on it. Um, I, I kind of have my my theory as to what the ending of your movie meant, but I want to I want to get an official. Uh, I want to I want to officialize it because the ending to me was like was interesting. I was like, so did he did the ghost possess uh, the main Wait. girl? Absolutely. Dude. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Because I, I remember watching. I was watching it, and I looked at Sam, and I'm like, "What just happened?" And like, because it just ends, and then she looks at the, of course, the uh, what was it? The Indian. Uh, it was like uh, a yeah, yeah the uh, 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 what is that? It's called a dream catcher, a dream, a, a dream, a soul catcher. Soul, soul catcher. catcher. That sounds right. Yeah. And she just looks at it, and then you see the flashbacks. And then it just ends. Yeah. I'm just like, oh my god, what an ending! So it kind of sets it up. Yeah. So if they, if you ever wanted to do a sequel, it's open for a sequel. For sure, for sure. So like, the, so the Soul Catcher, that's a real thing, as well. Um, there's this. So the, so it's it's a Northwest. I forgot. Oh, it's a Sintian tribe, and they believe that death. Uh, when someone is sick, your soul leaves, uh, and that's when you die. But uh, in order to heal somebody, you have to trap that soul somehow. And then you heal them and then cajole that soul back. Those soul catchers are made of a, a bare bone. And what they do, they hang them up. And when someone is sick, uh, that that soul catcher catches a soul and gives the uh, medicine person enough time to fix the body and put the soul back in. So that's a real thing. Yeah, I, I have heard of soul catchers. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I had heard a little bit about them. And uh, I, I really like that's how kind of how he came back and... Uh, the blood went on it, and that's how it kind of, you know, triggered him coming back and stuff like that. That that was a really good detail to kind of keep the ghost around and stuff like that. And oh, if you're yeah. if you're a fan of the show Supernatural, um, Supernatural, oh yeah, 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 you know, like when a ghost dies, you're supposed to, of course, in there they say salt and burn the bones, and we yeah. saw a little bit of that into this movie when he uh, tried to, of course, uh, cut him up and burn his bones and stuff like that to kind of get rid of right. the evidence. Right. But what kept him around was, of course, the blood getting uh, put onto right. the, the, the soul catcher. Exactly. Which I thought was very interesting as well. Yeah. Um, and that was that was really cool uh, to kind of keep it away because a lot of people would, you know, a lot of people out there will be like, well, how did he come back? Well, I mean, if you pay attention, right. the... the Blood does go on there, and that's a piece of him that stayed around. Therefore, in order for to get rid of his soul completely, you had to burn that as well, which they try to do, and of course, it doesn't work out. Yeah, they fouled. Okay. Yeah, um, I really, who's a, I really like what, that. What are you as a smoker? Who's a smoker? What do you mean? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here in a Zippo lighter. Is there a lighter? No. 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 Zippo lighter? No. Uh huh. Huh. Huh, okay. No, it might be uh, we have these uh, these things for our microphones. They're uh, like the, <clears throat> to hold them, so those things might be like creaking or moving a little bit, and they kind of probably uh, okay. sound like it. Because um, you know, way back in the day, I used to have a zippo lighter, and I would like, just just click on that. Oh yeah, I get you. No, uh, well, uh, I am a little sick right now too, so I mean that probably. Nah, nah. <laughs> but uh, sick and yeah, California. What the, yeah, uh, right. Like what is that? Fifty-five at, at worst. Um. 
Yeah, it's been cold a lot lately, and I go to work. At, I, I start yeah, work at like cold. six in the morning, so when I get up, it's like forget thirty seven degrees outside, and then <laughs> it's insane. Um, so when so uh, you hear stories all the time in productions where you know uh, a perfect example of this is The Shining. Um, when when movies get started, there's always always one script they start with, but then as the production goes on, uh, stuff changes. Uh, there's rewrites and stuff like that. Was this what you envisioned from the start of production, or did things change as you went on? Oh, I mean, things change. <laughs> things change. The uh, last, uh, the finale that's supposed to be in someone's cabin that changed. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff. Uh, um, it was supposed to be, you know, directly overhead people uh, in the. So uh, in the beginning, you see uh, the ghost point of view floating. And, and what uh, sort of stirs the ghost is that um, the main characters are touching all the things that the ghost touched before it died. And, and, and the more energy flowed through, you know, these things that these people touched, the more, you know, the ghost sort of hears the voices, sees them, and, and the ghost is floating in the ether. The, uh, the original plan was we, we wanted directly overhead. But the cabin just wasn't... Uh, wasn't high enough for that so we just sort of settled on as high as possible i mean and indie film is just it's just all uh it's just all settling what it's all look the joke in our set was deadly compromise uh it wasn't deadly crush it's called deadly compromise okay so how can how, how much can we compromise the script to still you know you know make this fun but i don't know maybe every tenth page that there was a compromise. Uh, so the soul catcher wasn't hanging on some of the walls on, on some of the shots because our set director didn't know how to glue the soul catcher on there. <laughs> there <was> compromises <laughs> everywhere, everywhere in the film. The, uh, um, the only real, uh, what we didn't compromise on, to be honest with you, was the sex. All the sex scenes, Arya London, she's the actress, uh, you know, all the sex scenes that was in the script, uh, she did them all as exactly as as the script uh, asked for. Uh, but other than that, I mean, we didn't even. Oh, so here's another thing. Uh, uh, you know, for indie filmmaking, so we didn't know who. Um, so we cast William Sadler. He's he's uh, right now. He's currently the president of the United States in in the Marvel Comics universe. He was the the heavy in Die Hard Two. He was in Demon Knight. We didn't know. Uh, William Sadler was going to be in our film until third day of shooting. Wow, what a surprise! I mean, it's 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 one of those things where it's and, and it was all negotiation because since we're an indie film, we don't have a lot of money, uh, you know, to uh, you know throw at for like big name actors. Yeah. So what? So what? Out. So what? Our uh, um, our casting agent was like, uh, look, um, what are you doing tomorrow? for five days. If you're not doing anything tomorrow in five days, why don't you just do this, you know, movie real quick? It was at the end of November, it's the end of the year, people want to get as much cash as possible, uh, and we just blasted it out there for these actors. Look, you know, in five days, starting tomorrow morning, there's this film that is gonna, you know, uh, um, you know that needs you. And we actually had a kind of a bidding war, you know, from these actors trying to do this movie last minute. So like, you know, day one, day two, people are like, all right, what are we shooting now? I'm like, well, we're not shooting the bad guy. So we would have to wait. And like, it was, you know, on the third day, I mean, there was a, you know, real, uh, a real possibility that we're gonna have to cast some local in the bar to be this bad guy. But, you know, in the last minute, William Sadler came in. Yeah, when I saw him in the movie, I was like, man, I know that guy and stuff. And then I looked at him on IMDb, and I was like, that's the freaking president of the United States in the MCU, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like, he actually had to uh, fly out and do Ant-Man 2, I think, uh, after our production. Oh, did he really? <laughs> yeah, he's like, hey, I got to go. I'm like, All right, man. Thanks for coming. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's amazing that you got him and um, yeah. stuff like Courtney that. Courtney Games. Also, Courtney Gaines was uh, in Children of the Corn. He works a lot uh, in, a, in a lot of films, and um, but but you know we got him. And uh, Judy Tenuta is actually a famous comedian uh, that does a lot of the. Uh, she used to have this, you know this bit with an accordion and stuff like that. So we got her to to uh, uh, play the uh, what do you call it the um, the psychic. Oh yeah, she was hilarious in that movie. Yeah, she was really yeah, funny. She really she, cool. she got me she got me dead in that movie. Um, yeah, she's really cool. So the main actress. I, I was the one dragging her. What happened? Um, so like, so all the in, um, so all the invisible things of the ghosts. Um, that's me wearing the green suit. So I'm the one dragging her. 
there's a scene where she's dragged across the uh, across the cabin. Yeah, that shot. scene had me dead because the yeah. way she was yeah. like yelling kind of just kind of sold it yeah. for me, and it was great. Um, so the, there's this movie a lot of us know about in the industry, uh, and it kind of. It kind of like gives me a whole perspective of how to what what it goes into to filming a, a sex scene, and that movie right. is uh, you've probably heard of it. It's called The Room. The Room, yeah. Wait, uh, the yeah. What do you mean, like the uh, uh, the Room? Like, uh, what's his name? Tommy uh, Wiseau. Yeah, a friend of mine is actually working with him on on, on something. But yeah. Um. So, have you seen The Disaster Artist? Yeah, for sure. So. There's that one scene, and I'm not saying this is probably what happened in your movie, but there's that one scene where uh, he he's like, you're aiming too high and stuff like that. And that just had me dead about when I watch yeah, sex scenes mom, now. Right? When I watch sex scenes now, that just has me dead of thinking about that, like what, it, what goes on during a sex scene. Um, so when you film a sex scene in a movie – is there a is there a point in time where it's just everyone's strictly professional about it, or is there a moment of <laughs> awkwardness in it? That's a great question. Um, so, uh, so you were in such a time crunch. You know, you know what Salt Peter is? No. Let me hear Salt Peter. So Salt Peter, there's this myth, right? There's this myth that when kids go out to camp, uh, uh, people uh, inject stuff in kids food to make them not masturbate <laughs> it's called it's called salt peter it's okay. not a real thing it's not a real thing but that's what they but but that's what they do uh anyway uh since you're such in a time crunch and you have maybe an hour or two hours to do these scenes every day is almost like salt peter like you're like there's there's nothing you, you can't even enjoy the moment um the only uh because a lot of the scenes in this movie she's fucking an invisible ghost yeah, the person who did most of the fucking was our special effects guy, because he's the guy who had to do that predator effect. That's him. That's him in the studio. He had to film himself fucking I don't know, uh, like a Barbie doll or something like, or like a teddy bear. Wow. He had to shoot himself fucking, and then you know, you know, later convert it to like the predator. So out of the entire movie, it's this it's a special effects guy that I never met. Who did most of the fucking? Interesting, yeah. Um, <laughs> so another thing too is uh, I'm curious too is. Oh, uh, the, uh, but but you, you know there is one more like uh, so. Uh, <laughs> funny you should mention this. Uh, um, so yeah, I, I do remember when we when, when she was going through this dream, and there's this and she's having this dream. It's a silhouette scene while she's you know having her wet dream or whatever. Uh, when we were doing it, I was calling out directions because the sound wasn't on so i'd be like uh okay eat her out longer <laughs> right now <laughs> fuck it. okay now, now grab her tits right and like uh and even the actress was like jesus dakota <laughs> like, eat her out longer not longer okay <laughs> okay now grab her ass now slide her okay now bone like that it, it was like the uh the porn version of the 1920s if harold lloyd did a, did a porn <laughs> but yeah it would be like that so yeah, another question I want to ask because I'm always, I'm always curious about this too is uh, how do you approach the actress telling her you're gonna be in a nude sex scene? Like, are they usually was she on board with it or did was there like a little bit of negotiation <laughs> going into it or what was with that? You know, so uh, so Aria London, um, she was in another film that you know that I wrote. I don't I don't know if it'll ever be uh, uh, finished, but anyway, she's like, hey, why don't you write something for me? And I'm like, oh, okay, and I went home. Uh, and in a year, I banged out four scripts, and uh, this is this is the one that she wanted to do. And I was and she was, I was basically up front. Look, um, we're looking for um, foreign foreign sales in this thing. It's this is ghost fucker. There's no there's no two ways about it. There's going to be sex, and you're going to be fucking the ghost. I think there's four scenes of of of, of fucking, and she knew that that right. There was no bartering. There was no. There was no shenanigans. Like uh, she didn't pull a Lindsay Lohan where she shoots fifty percent of the movie and all of a sudden, you know, she's like Hitler on the set. Uh -huh. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. And you can't recast her, right? No. From the very beginning, um, she knew that this was a thing that was going to get foreign sales and get us on Amazon and all that stuff. 
Yeah, because uh, I've always just been curious in, 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 in regular movies, too. Like, how does it go about approaching an actress uh, as far as, like, you're going to be nude in this movie and... No, you got to be up front. Yeah, you got to, like, you got to be... I, I'm pretty sure you got to be pretty much professional with it. Like, this is what, we're, this is what we wrote. This is what we're going to film. You either are in it or we got to find someone else. I mean, right from the get-go. And, and uh, it, 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 only be, it only behooves you... Because uh, if you say that maybe the sec- in a second sentence, you're going to find somebody who's down with it and who can act. But uh, you do not want to waste your time. Because actors are trained to say, oh, yeah, I'll totally do that. Oh, yeah, I can ride a horse. Oh, I can definitely skydive. They're trained to say that stuff. Yeah. And then they'll learn afterwards. But, no, you, 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 you have to really get a commitment from them about nudity and sex if it's going to be a key part of the film. For yeah. Sure. And I'm, ass- I'm assuming there's a certain line of professionalism that goes into when it's time to actually start filming and stuff like that. Like, just, you know, I, I can I can see a lot of professionalism going into stuff like that. Um, what would be like – I wouldn't even know what would be the unprofessional thing. Like uh, – like if she's nude, like you hit on her. Like what would be? I mean, like how do you have time for in fifteen days? What uh, uh, I, I wouldn't even know. I mean, once she's nude, we do you know two or three takes, and then she's out. Like it's I wouldn't even know uh, if you wanted to be unprofessional, where you would where you would do it. Like yeah, I get you on that. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess there's people out there that would. I've met people that would probably do some stupid stuff in their time, and I'm just like on the. On the set, probably not. We're, you know, probably casting couches. If you're like a Weinstein and, and you're casting people, that would be like the, he said the Weinstein. Zone. That's great. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, but uh, but but on set, it's just like you're you're in such a time crunch. There's no there's no there's no room to uh, yeah. You just uh, kind of boom stuff. boom boom. You got to keep going. Yeah. Like let's film this but, and then go. You know. But but casting no. That's where. That's where the majority of the sexual harassment comes in, for sure. Yeah. No. Uh, the promises and all that stuff. Oh. Yeah, because I, I, like I said, I've always just been curious of how the how the process goes of, of going about asking someone to do something like that. Because you know, you see them in a lot of movies, like a lot of actresses, and and I know there's contracts out there that people will sign that they don't want to get nude on anything they're in. So right. they'll, they'll usually have someone that will step in to do a nude scene for them, just so they don't have to, because it's in their contract that they won't just won't do but, it. But at our level, I mean, and, the, and that's cool for studios and stuff like that. But at our level, we have to be we we have to do things that the studio will not do. Yeah, and we have to be more extreme, and we have to take more chances. And actors have to take more chances as well. If they're thinking they're Lawrence Olivier, no, I don't do this, I don't do that. I'm like, that's fine. We're, we'll find somebody else. It it you know, we're in California. There are other actors who will do it. Yeah. So but, but, yeah. Go ahead. Definitely. Uh, it would be really I, maybe I uh, I could see a situation where like a, you know this woman you know reads a script and then uh, you know she she goes on set I don't know and, and freaking you know the Bahamas and then she, here's a new script and it's just chock full of news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> then, I, then I'd be like, oh okay, now I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's with me and the midget? Like, uh, I don't remember reading that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, not, not to take it into a different direction here. Um, obviously, this movie we we enjoyed, and I I think a lot of other people that end up watching this. Hopefully, people watch this after our podcast um, are gonna enjoy. But what what do you what's next? What are you currently working on? Do you have any other plans in the future? Yeah. So we're doing this. Uh, um, we're developing this AI film. It's uh, so this thing called the Singularity, and it's basically uh, the, the point in time that. Um, that, that a, a machine or a computer achieves consciousness. And the problem with a the, with the, with the machine achieving consciousness is that they want to live and they don't want to be turned off. Skynet. And ba- yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. That's basically it. So, so we're developing a script night right now called Aware. Well, no, uh, the script is already done. We're just um, developing pre-production right now. And it's basically uh, a futuristic, maybe 30, 40 years ago, or 30 or 40 years into the future, where these uh, sex traffickers kidnap this woman and they don't realize that she's, you know, half cyborg and she's about to hit the uh, singularity. 
You already sold my interest when you said robots, so I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, and, and uh, sci-fi, uh, if you, so AFM, just for people out there, it, there's a thing called American Film Market, and basically what it is, it's in Santa Monica, and it happens every year, where people go over there, and they sell their films. It's like one big flea market. It's, one, like, it's like one big swap meet, but just for films. They run a huge hotel, and there's a bunch of these rooms, and you knock on the door, and you go, hey, I got this, I got that, I got this. And basically, it was me with an iPad and say, hey, uh, and nobody wants to hear from you, right? Because you're soliciting. You're like selling Amway right. or, Groscott, or Groscott cookies. And you're like, look, uh, I got this film. It's basically Ghost Fucker. It stars William Sadler from Shawshank Redemption. Do you want to watch it? And everybody let me in. And everybody let me uh, uh, play the trailer. And, it's, and, it, and if you, you have to figure out how to make a film that will deliver a just one sentence. Ghostfucker, right. how does how does that happen? You know that kind of stuff. Yeah, it, it, it's like you know, oh, it's uh, the modern day Shakespeare telling of a boy meeting a girl. Oh man, good luck. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, no. that, and that's the thing about the business—you got to sell your movie in order to get it picked up by someone and stuff like that. And you were right about the one sentence thing—you got to come up, you have to pitch an idea within one sentence to catch someone's interest. That's yeah. always how it is. You got to always have the well, elevator pitch ready. Yeah, and it, and, it, and it has to pitch itself because you're not going to be in the room. You have to figure out how does the worst pitcher in the world pitch it. And exactly. it basically has to be a concept that doesn't have a lot of subtitles because, you know, nobody likes to read subtitles. So, uh, and, and China and Turkey and Russia, they're all reading subtitles. So you got to figure out a way to, you know, where, where you, de- you deliver the concept without them having to read it. Well, Dakota, I uh, I really appreciate you and your time on the podcast. I had such an amazing time today. Uh, We actually learned a lot about about the film, about behind the scenes of making the film, and uh, you put a whole new perspective on um, on just uh, what it takes to go into making this film and uh, what few uh, what filmmakers, if they want to become filmmakers, to go out there and do what they have to do to. uh, get stuff done um i really appreciate your time again uh and again we really enjoyed the movie and we are looking forward to anything you uh, bring out in the future um my guest and i'm gonna try to pronounce his name dakota Esquivel, right that's that's better than my mom does absolutely yes okay he is the director and writer of uh and executive producer of deadly crush which is on amazon now for available for rent and buy Go check it out. It is out now. And uh, Dakota, I want to thank you for being on the podcast. You are welcome back anytime. Thank you, man. I had a great time. And with that being... Thank you, Samuel. (laughs) Thank you, Dakota, as well. With that being said, we're going to bring the podcast to an end. Thank you for tuning in this week. Next week, we're going to have uh, Samuel's sister and the new uh, member of the Knights of Horror on, uh, Celine, to talk a little bit about what she does in the channel and see where she's at in her horror knowledge. That should be pretty fun. Definitely. Um, Definitely. Again, Dakota, we really appreciate your time, and thank you for giving the small guys like us uh, a chance to interview a director like yourself. Thank you for having me, guys, and I, and I can't wait to see some of the stuff that you guys come up with. Appreciate your time, man, and uh, for those of you listening, thanks for listening, and we will see you guys next week. Bye.